Hello, and welcome back to the WellBe Podcast. This podcast is designed to help you learn, expand what you thought was possible, and become as empowered as you can be in your health. I'm your host, Adrienne Nolan Smith, a board certified holistic patient advocate and the founder of WellBe. And today I'm excited to bring you the first real episode of the WellBe Podcast since I became a mom nearly seven months ago. Today's episode is a special mid-season bonus episode because we're actually working on something really special for you guys, and I want to start season seven when we can actually talk about it. Plus, being a new mom, it's hard enough to juggle house chores, everything my baby son needs, and my well-be work. Recording fantastic new guides and interviews for you guys and focusing on a big new project was a lot to take on coming off of maternity leave. So without further ado, the special mid-season bonus episode is the April 2022 WellBe Wrap-Up. If you've never heard one of our wrap-up episodes before, we put one out every few months and cover all the health news and research we think is really important for you to know. From the results of big new studies to actions by the EPA, FDA, and other government bodies that affect the health of all of us. So we break these stories down for you and then put our own little twist on them. In preparing for this wrap-up episode, we went through dozens and dozens of studies and news pieces to determine how we can help you be most empowered in your health and most aware as consumers, citizens, and people trying to protect their health and prevent disease. Before we jump in, if you've ever listened to one of our wrap-up episodes, you know they take a tremendous amount of work to put together. So if you like them and you haven't yet left a review, please tell us how much you value them by leaving us a review right now. You don't even have to stop listening to this episode. Just scroll all the way down on the WellBe podcast page and click write a review. Give it a few stars and a few words and then press submit in the top right hand corner. It's super fast and easy, but actually very important for any podcast. So thank you for doing that now. When we began the year, it seemed like COVID was mostly in the rearview mirror, but then Omicron swept through the country and turned everything upside down. So needless to say, there are some COVID coverage in the mix in this wrap-up, but also tons of other important pieces of health research and articles about wellness. After all, staying informed on the latest wellness news is one of the most important ways you can protect the health of yourself and your loved ones. So here are the eight most important health and wellness news stories to know about this April. Story number one. A huge new study found that taking antibiotics, especially for a long period of time, can significantly raise your risk of developing colon cancer later in life. In the study, researchers in Sweden looked at more than 40,000 cases of colon cancer, making this the largest epidemiological study to ever explore the link between cancer and antibiotics. They found not only compelling evidence for the link, but also identified precisely where these antibiotic-induced colon cancers emerge the proximal colon, which is the part of the colon that connects the small intestine to the lower right abdomen. According to their findings, those who took antibiotics for more than six months had the highest colon cancer risk, 17% higher than those who had taken no antibiotics. But even short courses of antibiotics carried an associated cancer risk. These findings align with past studies connecting antibiotic use with cancer. Researchers have theories on the reasons for this link. Antibiotics disrupt the balance of bacteria in the microbiome, which may allow for infectious bugs, aka bad bacteria, to proliferate, which can ramp up inflammation, generating reactive chemicals that could damage DNA and cause tumors. This shift in bacteria can also make the gut lining more permeable, allowing bacteria to accumulate on the colon wall and form biofilms, which are associated with 90% of proximal colon cancers. While the researchers noted that these findings only point to correlation, not causation, they make sense given what we know about the impact of antibiotics on the gut and the role gut health plays in disease formation. We're hopeful that this data will help rein in the overprescription of antibiotics. But in the meantime, while we're waiting for that to happen, we're going to continue to avoid these medications whenever humanly possible. And also buy organic to avoid antibiotics in any meat or dairy we purchase. And wild, not farmed salmon. Story number two. A recent NIH-funded study found that consuming a diet high in fish-derived fats and low in vegetable-derived fats was associated with reduced frequency and intensity of migraines among chronic migraine sufferers. 
The study included 182 chronic migraine sufferers who averaged more than 16 headache days per month and over five hours of migraine pain per headache day. Oh, that sounds horrible. And whose overall quality of life was greatly impacted by their migraines despite being on multiple medications. Researchers divided participants into three groups. The first ate a diet high in fatty fish or oils from fatty fish and low in vegetable oils. The second ate a diet high in both types of fat, and the third ate a diet low in fats from fish and high in vegetable oil, which most closely mimics the average American diet. Participants then monitored and recorded their migraines during the study period. At the end of the study, researchers found that the diet high in fatty fish and low in vegetable oil produced a 30 to 40 percent reduction in total headache hours per day, severe headache hours per day, and overall headache days per month compared to the other groups. Their blood samples also had lower levels of pain-related lipids. This study corroborates and expands upon previous research that linked linoleic acid found in vegetable oil to inflammation and pain processing tissues and pathways associated with migraines. If you suffer from migraines, you know how debilitating and miserable they can be, and if you don't, count yourself lucky. More than 4 million people worldwide have chronic migraines, and they're particularly common among women aged 18 to 44. What's more, currently available medications usually only offer partial relief and come with side effects that range from inconvenient to dangerous. This study offers hope that dietary changes can provide relief and shows us yet again how much your food choices matter. If you're looking for other natural ways to cure migraines, check out the WellBe Migraine Guide on GetWellBe.com. Story number three. The Epstein-Barr virus, also known as EBV, which causes glandular fever, aka mononucleosis, aka mono, or the kissing disease, has been in the news. New research suggests that it may be the biggest driver of multiple sclerosis, MS, and other research shows an association between reactivated EBV and long-haul COVID symptoms. Plus, one of the studies linking EBV to long-haul COVID also identified several other risk factors that might determine whether or not someone experiences long COVID symptoms. Harvard scientists tracked 10 million U.S. soldiers over the course of two decades. That's a lot of people conducting blood tests every two years to determine if they had contracted EBV. The results found that those who had EBV were 32 times more likely to get MS than those who had not contracted the virus. No other infection appeared to raise MS risk. Oh my goodness. To unearth this link, researchers analyzed the soldier's level of neurofilament light chain, which is a protein produced in the body when nerve damage occurs in the body and a hallmark of MS. They found that levels of neurofilament light chain also increased after EBV infection, which they say is nearly definitive evidence of a link between the two. A study published in the journal Pathogens looked at the connection between EBV and long COVID. They found that among the 30 patients, so not a huge study, with long COVID symptoms, 67 were positive for EBV reactivation, compared with just 10% of the control group who had contracted COVID but weren't experiencing long-term symptoms. Most of us have dormant, harmless viruses in our body that we contracted years earlier, but some, like EBV, can be reactivated. This reactivation can happen because of stress as well as a weakened immune system, both of which COVID-19 can cause. This study is one of several investigations into how latent viruses might contribute to long COVID symptoms, including another that identified EBV alongside several other risk factors for long COVID. The study looked at 309 long-haul COVID patients and identified four risk factors, including reactivated EBV, type 2 diabetes, and the presence of long COVID in the blood being the third, which indicates that the virus spread from the lungs to other parts of the body via the blood. Then the fourth and the most common risk factor was the presence of certain autoantibodies, which are antibodies that mistakenly attack the body in autoimmune conditions like lupus. In the study, 60% of patients with long COVID had autoantibodies. Other studies have linked long COVID to asthma, advanced age, and unhealthy gut bacteria. 
The conditions we're talking about here are very serious. MS is a crippling illness that can leave you unable to walk and affects 1 million Americans. Long COVID symptoms like brain fog, fatigue, and racing heart rate can be debilitating, and they afflict 10 to 30% of all COVID-19 patients, including young, previously healthy people with mild COVID cases, including young, previously healthy, or they think they are very healthy, people with mild COVID cases. So these discoveries are important. Targeting EBV and other underlying viruses might help prevent MS from developing in people and might even lead to the discovery of a cure. However, it's important to note that more research is needed. About 90% of people worldwide get EBV and most of them don't end up with MS. So there are clearly other factors at play. In terms of COVID, the link between dormant viruses and long-haul COVID might help people finally get rid of their symptoms through vitamin C and zinc supplementation, as well as antiviral medications, whether those be natural and herbal or pharmaceutical. But most doctors aren't regularly testing long COVID patients for reactivated viruses. So if you're suffering from long COVID, be sure to speak up and ask to be tested with whatever kind of healthcare professional is helping you now or get a new one who can. In general, all of these studies show just how seriously a virus can impact your health in the long term and how the best move is to avoid contracting viruses in the first place. That means keeping your immune system as strong as possible by getting rest, reducing stress, avoiding exposures to harmful toxins, and above all, prioritizing your gut health. Story number four. New research shows that the natural COVID immunity produced by contracting COVID-19 is more effective at protecting people against the virus than vaccines, while suppressed CDC data on the effectiveness of COVID boosters for 18 to 49-year-olds show that the additional shots may not have been necessary for everyone in that age group. Now, again, this is being recorded and published at the beginning of April 2022, and the more we learn about COVID-19, the more things change. So this is what we know right now based on the latest information that we have. So throughout the pandemic, the CDC and the NIH have called into question how effective natural immunity is at protecting people from COVID. They maintain this line despite evidence pointing to the power of natural immunity, including their own data. In January 2022, the CDC released data from New York and California that showed natural immunity to be 2.8 times as effective in preventing hospitalizations and 3.3 to 4.7 times as effective in preventing infection compared to vaccination. Still, the agency has downplayed the benefits of natural immunity and failed to conduct research into how long this immunity lasts. Spurred by this, Researchers at Johns Hopkins conducted their own study, in which they found that nearly two years after infection, two years, COVID antibodies were present in 99% of people who had contracted the virus. They also found that regardless of which variant people contracted, the antibodies protected them against Delta and Omicron. Both the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines have significantly reduced effectiveness against Omicron, and Delta. So this is especially important for those variants. This aligns with the finding of the largest study on the subject, which was out of Israel, which found that natural immunity was 27 times as effective as vaccinated immunity in preventing symptomatic illness. Wow. The CDC has also played up the need for booster shots for certain age groups. When it published data on the effectiveness of boosters in adults in early February, it left out numbers for those aged 18 to 49, a huge portion of the population. When they finally added that data, nearly two weeks later, it showed that this age group was already well protected by their first two shots and benefited the least from the booster. In explaining the reason for this omission, the CDC cited fear that the data would be misinterpreted. I'm sorry, but what's being misinterpreted? I think we're interpreting this correctly, that these booster shots weren't needed. They also mentioned, quote unquote, bureaucratic roadblocks, i.e. politics. The fact that politics are in this is sickening to me, and I'm sure to you as well. No matter what you think about the COVID vaccines, these findings underscore the fact that the government and big agencies and organizations associated with it aren't always telling us the whole truth. And in this case, the truth was being purposely withheld from us. 
it's often essential to dig a little deeper to find the most authoritative, complete information. The findings on natural immunity also show just how amazing and smart the immune system is and emphasize, once again, the importance of keeping it functioning at an optimal level and restoring it to greatness if it becomes compromised. Story number five. In two instances of Monsanto, now Monsanto Bayer, being held accountable, the Mammoth Agricultural Company was ordered to pay $185 million to three school teachers over alleged brain damage from PCBs and promised to stop selling its glyphosate-based herbicides, which includes Roundup, its most famous, to the residential market, meaning for use by you and me, by 2023, so not very far away at all. Polychlorinated biphenyls, or PCBs, are mixtures of chemical compounds manufactured by Monsanto that were used worldwide as coolants and lubricants in electrical equipment until they were banned in 1979 because of the risks that they pose to environmental and human health. However, PCBs can still be found in many commercial and industrial buildings around the world, and one of those was Sky Valley Education Center in Monroe, Washington. Three teachers who work there allege that they suffered brain damage from exposure to PCBs in the school's fluorescent lighting and sued Monsanto. This past summer, they were awarded $185 million in damages, a verdict with which Monsanto shockingly disagrees. Glyphosate-based herbicide like Roundup pose a serious threat to human health, and we've written before about the struggle to hold Monsanto accountable for its repercussions, like when in 2018, the company paid $289 million to a man who developed terminal non-Hodgkin's lymphoma as a result of Roundup exposure. In a victory for advocates and consumers, Monsanto announced in July that it will end sales of all glyphosate-based herbicides in the U.S. residential market by 2023. The chemical will still be sold for agricultural purposes, but the Center for Food Safety is currently legally challenging the EPA with regard to the approval of glyphosate at all. Yes, thank you. If it's not safe for residential use, why is it safe for commercial use considering most of the food that we eat is commercially grown and then we buy it at a grocery store? It makes no sense. The EPA has admitted that it made serious errors in its approval of glyphosate in general, but yet has not set any deadline for revisiting their decision to keep it legal for commercial farms. These are two definitively positive pieces of news as they prove that speaking up and advocating for your health can have an impact. Even enormously powerful companies like Monsanto aren't immune from being held accountable. But still, there's a long way to go, and you still need to stay informed to protect your health from chemicals like PCBs and glyphosate. A 2019 investigation found that millions of fluorescent lights containing PCBs remain in schools and daycare centers around the U.S., despite being banned. And this is startling given that PCBs have been associated with increased rates of many different kinds of cancer. And despite the end of residential glyphosate sales, Roundup will still be sold to large-scale agricultural operations, which means that farm workers, consumers, and the environment remain very much at risk. So in addition to continuing to advocate for the complete removal of harmful chemicals from public spaces, we're going to take action to protect our loved ones and our own health. In the case of these two chemicals, that means asking about the lights before enrolling your kids in schools or daycares. We realize that it may be really hard to get a straight answer about this, but you can't know if you don't try, right? And buying organic, aka herbicide and pesticide-free food and other products whenever possible. Another pretty frightening story, story number six. The FDA has warned parents against buying three popular baby formulas manufactured at an Abbott plant in Michigan after they were linked to five infant hospitalizations, two of which resulted in death. Certain batches of the baby formula Similac, Elementum, and Elicare have been linked with infant illness and death and recalled by the manufacturer Abbott. The FDA has warned against purchasing these products and is currently investigating five reports of serious infant illness, including two that resulted in both babies dying. The illnesses were linked to bacterial contamination, with one instance of salmonella and four of chronobacter sacazacum, which is a rare and dangerous germ associated with blood infections and other complications. 
Before I go any further, you know if you are a parent, your heart just breaks at the idea of feeding your baby formula and watching them get so sick that they would actually die. As a new mom myself, I cannot imagine anything more horrifying and heartbreaking, and I sincerely hope that Abbott is held very much accountable for this. Back to the story. Upon inspecting the Abbott plant in Michigan, the FDA found that environmental samples tested positive for the chronobacter bacteria and also uncovered potential manufacturing problems and records showing that previous batches of formula had been destroyed due to contamination. This situation is a parent's worst nightmare, as I mentioned. It's unthinkable that the simple act of feeding one's child could result in hospitalization or even death, and becomes even more horrifying when you consider that Similac is one of the best-selling baby formulas in the world, and that the plant's own inspectors say they didn't find any contamination when they tested their samples. Obviously, something in their testing process is not right. This is just another testament to the fact that big corporations don't have your health and safety at the top of their priority list. When it comes to the well-being of your child, you absolutely cannot afford to take this kind of risk, especially since it seems like this kind of story comes up again and again. That's why it's essential to only buy baby food and formula from fully vetted brands that you know you can trust. Our non-toxic product database has several well approved options if you're looking for safer baby formulas or food for your loved ones, so definitely head to getwellbe.com and check out that non-toxic product database. Story number seven. A new study found that exposure to the synthetic chemicals called phthalates were linked to premature deaths among people aged 55 to 64 in the U.S. In the study, researchers looked at data from over 5,000 American adults analyzing their phthalate levels and mortality rates and controlling for pre-existing conditions like heart disease, diabetes, BMI, so body mass index, and unhealthy lifestyle habits. Their results found that phthalates were linked to early death in adults aged 55 to 64 and that those with the highest level of phthalates had a higher risk of death from any cause, but especially cardiovascular disease or heart disease. Extrapolating out from their sample, they estimated that phthalates may contribute to around 100,000 premature deaths every year, and that these deaths cost the U.S. over $40 billion in lost economic productivity. We know, we know, it's pretty gross that money is the measure used to talk about the loss of human life, but it's one of those metrics included in the study, and it does give some sense of the impact on our government of these losses. Phthalates have long been associated with a whole host of health issues and are known endocrine disruptors, meaning that they disrupt your body's hormonal system. Even small hormonal disruptions can have significant health consequences, which helps explain why phthalates have been linked to so many poor health outcomes. This is particularly concerning given that phthalates are everywhere in PVC plumbing, vinyl flooring, water-resistant products, children's toys, food packaging, detergents, clothing, personal care products, and more. You're exposed every time you breathe contaminated air or consume foods that come into contact with phthalate-containing plastic. And like so many substances known to be harmful to human health and the environment, but that's a whole nother story, phthalates are legal. That means it's up to us to protect ourselves and our loved ones. You can do this by avoiding plastics as much as possible. Never putting plastic containers into the microwave or the dishwasher, where the heat can then break down linings and make it easier for your body to absorb the chemicals. Reducing your reliance on processed foods and only using and consuming products that you know to be safe. As I mentioned, our non-toxic product database on getwellbe.com is a treasure trove for making the switch from conventional to clean, safe products. And finally, story number eight. A new large study suggests that making the switch from a typical Western diet to a healthier eating style can add up to 13 years to your life, especially if you start when you're young. In the study, Norwegian researchers used existing meta-analyses and data from the Global Burden of Diseases study, which is a fascinating study. It's a database, actually, that tracks 286 causes of death, 286 different causes of death. That's wild. 369 diseases and injuries, and 87 risk factors in 204 countries and territories around the world. That is a ton of data. 
They used the data to create a model of what would happen to longevity when you replace the typical Western diet heavily focused on red meat and processed foods with an optimized diet focused on fruits and vegetables, legumes, whole grains, and nuts with less red meat and processed foods. Their model found that if a woman began eating optimally at age 20, she could increase her lifespan by about 10 years, and that if a man did the same, he could add 13 years. If men and women made the switch at age 60, they could add nine and eight years, respectively. And even waiting until age 80 to make dietary changes could result in 3.5 additional years of life. The largest gains came from eating more legumes, so things like beans, lentils, peas, peanuts, whole grains, and nuts. Though this was just a model, these numbers are striking and impressive and could have a huge impact on American health, especially given how poorly Americans eat today. Currently, only 12% of adults consume the recommended amount of fruits and 10% of adults consume the recommended amount of vegetables. 95% of American adults don't get enough whole grains and 50% of Americans fail to eat the measly five recommended grams of nuts and seeds per day. Making these kinds of dietary changes is low hanging fruit, no pun intended, for not only improving your length of life, but also its quality. It's easy to replace red meat with lean poultry, fish, especially if you get migraines. Remember what I said about the connection between omega-3 fats, which are found in fish, and migraine reduction and elimination, or plant protein, and there are so many delicious and inexpensive options for getting adequate fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and nuts. We don't know about you, but this study inspires us to go make a big salad this evening, complete with garbanzo beans or chickpeas, quinoa, and a sprinkling of sunflower seeds. Yum. So that's all for the first Wellbe wrap-up of 2022 episode. I'd love to know what's an action you can take now based on the research findings and news that I've shared with you today. Perhaps it's switching to a Mediterranean diet or switching to non-toxic products without phthalates or grabbing a fish oil supplement or some wild salmon for dinner tonight. Whatever it is or whatever your thoughts or takeaways are from this research and news, make sure you let us know with a comment on the article version of this episode on getwellbe.com, and you'll find a link to it in the show notes. It's helpful for the entire Wellbe community to know your takeaways and insights. Also, while you're there, become a Wellbe Insider so that you can get all of our latest content, including when season seven of the Wellbe podcast will drop, special offers, news about this big new project we're working on, and personal notes I don't share anywhere else weekly in your inbox. Plus, you'll get a free copy of my audio guide on how to feel the best you've ever felt and heal anything, the 10 things you need to optimize your health and heal any health issue, big or small, naturally. Even if you're the healthiest person out there, I promise you'll learn something you didn't know that can optimize your health. If you haven't already and found this wrap-up episode helpful or interesting, subscribe to the podcast. This way you'll never miss a new episode and they'll be delivered to you whenever we publish a new one. And please share this episode with family or friends who you think might find it valuable and informative. It means a lot and helps more people find the podcast. If you already have, then thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Once again, this is your host, Adrian Nolan-Smith, and thanks for listening to the WellBe Podcast.